Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today we are going to take a look at the Phoenix F256K, which is a new retro computer. This got sent to me by Stephanie Allaire, who also designed the hardware of this, and she provided me with this review unit. Thank you for that. It does look quite funky with these uh, purple keys and the yellow cursor keys and the kind of C64 themed colored function keys here. And what this is, is a new retro 8-bit upgradable kind of to 16-bit system that has the classical wedge-shaped form factor of the systems from back in the 80s and early 90s that we all came to love. This is a new take on that form factor and there's a newly designed board in here that combines kind of the best of the old world of computing and the more modern stuff that we got used to in recent years like modern storage and communications. So let's take a look at this thing from the outside at first. The keyboard is very reminiscent of the Commodore 64 keyboard or the VIC-20 keyboard, if you will, because it is. It is handled internally in pretty much the same way the Commodore 64 keyboard is handled and passed on to the processor. It even comes with a run-stop key and a restore key. All good computers should have a run-stop and a restore key, in my opinion. <laughs> so the keyboard might look like an old school keyboard, but it actually has modern switches in it. Uh, mine has blue Gatoron switches, I think, which are clicky and feel pretty nice, actually. The keyboard uh, print is custom made by WASD, I believe. And we have some of the colors listed on here, just like on the C64. It doesn't have the Petsky characters listed here because I don't think it has Petsky. But yeah, run, stop, restore. And we have a shift lock key and a custom Phoenix key. It also came with uh, some extra keys, another K for the K version of this and the Junior, which is another incarnation of this project that doesn't come with an internal keyboard, but you can hook up a PS2 keyboard to that. And it pretty much is software compatible to this one. This is kind of like the more capable sibling of the F256 Junior, which is just a board that you can hook up external hardware to. So the F256K or F256K, I'm not quite sure what the naming convention is for this thing or if there is any, probably not. This comes in a resin printed case that actually feels pretty high quality with this nice embossed logo here. The badge was made by Retro Badge Man, I believe, who makes badges for many new retro systems and replacement batches for many older systems. So uh, that's a good address if you're looking for a replacement batch or for a custom batch or things like that. Uh, this has an expansion slot here where you can put RAM expansions as well as cartridges containing software like game cartridges or things like that. Currently there's a RAM expansion available for this. I think this is a standard PCI Express uh, slot. I'm not too familiar <laughs> with modern PCs, excuse me, but I think this is the standard form factor slot, although obviously it isn't the same pinout. This is just used as a connector for the cartridges, which is pretty smart because you can easily get these connectors off the shelf, probably. The F256K has three LEDs here, one for power, one for media access. We're going to take a look at the media that this can access, and we have one for the shift lock functionality. It has two standard Atari style joystick ports which are actually compatible with Atari style DB9 joysticks. They are not compatible with analog input devices like mice or pedals or stuff like that. They are purely digital but all common Atari compatible joysticks should work on these and they even support three separate fire buttons. There is an SD card slot on here, full size SD card slot. And here's where it gets interesting. We have quite some interesting connectivity on this machine. This is the back side. We have a reset switch here. We have a power switch. We have 
the power connector which is 12 volts 2 amps center positive very standard power supply that you can get off the shelf everywhere basically i'm just using one that i had lying around in my parts bin anyway we have a little usb port for debugging that's a debugging port where you can access certain things inside and uh, change things around like flash new kernel roms and things like that we have a mouse connector this is actually a fully fledged ps2 mouse connector this is an interesting one this is a connector that's also a mini din for an adapter that allows you to hook up uh, super nintendo and nintendo entertainment system controllers to this there's an adapter for that available i don't have that but also i don't have many super nintendo and nes controllers lying around this one caught my eye this is actually a Commodore compatible IEC connector. That's the serial bus used by Commodore peripherals like uh, floppy disk drives, printers, things like that connect via the IEC bus. So you can hook up Commodore drives to this and make them work on this system, which is pretty amazing. There's a DVI output for the video out. This is an RS-232 port, which also supports hooking up an adapter for Wi-Fi. This is a headphone jack and we have two RCA jacks for audio out. There is nothing on this side except the nice case, which actually feels really solid, really well made. It's a resin print, as I said, so there's no dithering going on or anything like that. So it's just quite smooth. On the back side, we have another expansion port here, and we have an array of dip switches, which enables you to do some settings. If you have certain peripherals, you need to set this up in a way that they are recognized by the system. We can enable a gamma correction, we can set the uh, power on screen mode, we can also set if the feather board, which is the Wi-Fi board, is installed and we can enable boot from RAM. So that's what these dip switches are for. I also got this, which is a three and a half inch floppy disk drive that matches the Phoenix and it's the FNX 1591 and uh, some of you might see certain similarities to the Commodore 1581 which is uh, the Commodore 64 and 128 three and a half inch floppy disk drive that was meant to be used with those systems and this is actually compatible with the Commodore 1581 if you put the correct kernel on here and can be used as that which is pretty amazing and it also of course matches the Phoenix because that's what it was designed to work with. It comes with the IEC connectors here that you can daisy chain other peripherals to like on the Commodore machines. It also has the same USB debugging port and it also uses the same 12 volt center positive power supply. We have another little power switch here and we have some dip switches in the back which are used to select the drive id which is pretty handy you can set this to different drive ids and these are the same as the ones you would use on a commodore machine uh, 8 9 11 uh, these are the first two dip switches the standard device number for floppy disk drives on commodore machines is device 8 and the same here this is set up to device 8 8 I believe and you can select a kernel for this and that's also changing the color of the LED I believe which is a pretty neat feature pretty stylish and as you've probably spotted in the background already this also comes with this very uh, conclusive and thick manual the Phoenix Bible, which is a hardware reference manual, super basic, is the basic dialect that is pre-installed on the F256. That's the manual in here. And we have the tiny core microkernel for the 65C02, which, spoiler alert, is the processor that is used in this by default. And as with all good retro manuals, this is of course spiral bound. I think it's very well designed and it's kind of reminiscent of the older manuals that you got when you bought a computer in the 80s. Very concise manual with everything you need to know about the internal workings of this and the system architecture is pretty much the same as for 
older systems. We have the super basic manual in here as well, reference manual, which is a very nice introduction to basic, in this case super basic, which is a pretty powerful dialect. I believe everything that is in this printed manual is also available online for downloading if you want to take a look. I'm going to link everything in the video description as usual. And if you're quick enough, you can just scan these QR codes to get to the links. And as my channel is primarily focused on the hardware side of things, like electronics repairs and stuff like that, we are going to crack this open and take a look inside and I'm going to walk you through the specs of this while I'm in there. I think the screws are under the rubber feet here, so I'm carefully going to remove those. I think these can be reapplied later. Actually, hex screws for a change. That's unusual. <laughs> these are two millimeter hex screws. So let's have a look-see. See if we can take this apart already. Oh, yeah, we can. Oh, okay, and there's a nice long ribbon cable on the keyboard. We're going to remove that carefully, I guess. And this is just a PCB with the key switches soldered to it. And then on the other side, the keycaps go on. Pretty nice detail here. There are 3D printed covers for the LEDs, which are also on the keyboard PCB. And uh, these are covered from the backside so they don't shine through the cooling vents on the bottom side of the machine, which is pretty thoughtful. The most interesting part, obviously, is the mainboard. And it looks pretty neat. Actually, there's uh, several different incarnations of these, mostly due to the fact that some of the FPGAs used were not readily available at the time of production, thanks to the global shortage of components. And speaking of PCBs, let me take a couple of seconds to thank the sponsor for this video, PCBWay, my favorite circuit board manufacturing house. And as it so happens, they have their ninth anniversary celebration going on currently. So there is going to be discounts and coupons and things like that. Prices are going to be even more reasonable than usual. So if you have a circuit board to produce or even have a 3D printed case you want to have professionally made, PCBWay is the place to check out. The link is in the video description. I highly recommend checking that out. Back to the Phoenix. So we have the main processor, which is a W65CO2S running at 6.29 megahertz. And the interesting thing about this system is that this also supports different processors. You can put a W65C816S in here. And also there is a variant of the 6809 Motorola chip, the FNX6809, which is an FPGA implementation of the classical 6809 chip, which uses some workarounds to make it work with the voltages used in this Phoenix board. We have 512K of flash storage in here. We also have a separate kernel flash chip in here for the kernels. There is 256 kilobytes of RAM on this little chip, which is expandable through the cartridge slot to uh, 512 kilobytes of internal RAM. There is a little real-time clock chip on here, which is buffered with a coin cell battery. I think it's CR2032 standard coin cell, which I'm probably going to put in here if I find one. And then there's uh, two chips that are kind of modeled after custom chips uh, you would usually get in an old computer. The Tiny Vicky, which is the graphics chip, and we have Tiny Beatrix, which is the sound chip. Probably Tiny Beatrix for beat. We are going to go into the specs of these separately. There is a header here for putting the Wi-Fi module in, which is an ESP feather board that can be used instead of the serial port, I believe. And we have some smaller support logic. This one is interesting because it's a genuine Yamaha OPL chip, which is used for sound as well. I think Tiny Beatrix does some SIT 
emulation. This is an FPGA and try on FPGAs. And uh, the OPL chip is actually an actual OPL3 chip made by Yamaha, still available these days. We have uh, the SD card slot, the connectors, we talked about those. The power switch is the same as on many actual vintage computers. And actually there's a JTAG header here. That's what this thing on the back of the machine is. There's the JTAG header for programming the FPGAs. So some of the specs of the tiny wiki. It is the graphics chip. It supports resolutions of 640 by 480 pixels at 60 hertz or 640 by 400 at 70 hertz. It supports text modes that are combinations of 80 or 40 characters horizontal and 60, 50, 30 or 25 vertical. So pretty standard for retro computers. Text mode colors are 16 foreground colors and 16 background colors out of a 24 bits palette, which is much better than what most retro computers had, most vintage computers had, I should say. There's three layers for the bitmaps and there's extra layers for sprites. This supports 64 sprites in 32 by 32 pixels, 24 by 24 pixels, 16 by 16 pixels or 8 by 8 pixels, which is plenty of sprites compared to other vintage systems. It also supports tiles, 16 by 16 or 8 by 8 tiles with an integrated smooth scrolling. So there's hardware scrolling for the tiles. It has one byte color per pixel for all graphical elements and the video memory is shared with the memory from the CPU. So uh, the 256K or the 512K if you have the expansion are shared between the tiny wiki and the CPU. And this FPGA also integrates timers, interrupt controllers, MMU and other things internally. Yeah, and that's pretty much all that there's on here. We have some additional jumpers here that are used for setting this into different UART programming modes. I believe that's what it says on the board. And there's a little graphic. I think this is Jumpman. Correct me if I'm wrong. Program load in progress. Please wait. And this whole board was designed by Stephanie Allaire with some help from the retro community, I believe. So all in all, this should be a pretty capable system. I'm just going to close it up again and try to power it on and have a look at what it can actually do. So I hooked up the Phoenix to a power supply. That's a two amp uh, power supply that I had lying around 12 volts, two amps uh, center positive, as I mentioned. And I have this hooked up to my large monitor here via a VGA cable. The DVI output is actually analog and digital, so you can use both VGA monitors and uh, HDMI or DVI monitors. With this, I also hooked up a little speaker to the headphone output for now, so we have some kind of sound output, hopefully. Uh, let's see what this does when I power it on. It should start up right into Super Basic. And the power LED comes on and there we are. This is an instant on system, just like the systems of the old days. So let's take a quick look at what Super Basic can actually do. Sorry for just filming the screen here, but that's the way I'm going to quickly show you some stuff in Basic. In Super Basic, that is, which was created by Paul Robson. It's very closely related to BBC Basic, which is considered uh, or widely considered one of the most powerful and sophisticated basic dialects. So that's a very cool basic dialect that's right on here, preloaded. The hardware is made by Stephanie Allaire. There's a microkernel that actually handles the I.O. Uh, storage and things like that by Jesse Oberreuter. Ruter, Oberreuter. It's actually a German name, which would be pronounced Oberreuter in German. I'm not sure how Jessie pronounces her name, so uh, sorry if I'm butchering some of that. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your names. We can access storage with some easy commands like uh, the directory command. Sorry, I formatted this SD card that is currently accessed with my Mac. So we have all these 
nice little hidden spotlight files and things like that on there. And I also already programmed a little basic program here, which I just dubbed Jan. And we can load this by just using the load command as you would in basic. This is not case sensitive, unlike other basic dialects, I think. Should work like this as well, yes. And it actually has quite some modern features for basic. It has some syntax highlighting, so you can see the different colors there. And it also does indentation for loops and things like that, which is pretty nice. And as you can see, this is a little graphics demo program that I made up uh, using some examples from the manual. This just prints Jan Beta was here in different colors in graphics mode over the screen. Yeah, pretty impressive, isn't it? <laughs> of course, there's more stuff that's possible with this thing in this basic dialect. It's pretty difficult for me to wrap my head around all the possibilities at this point. So this is going to be just a quick little introductory video about this system, I guess. And there's going to be more videos so yeah, the basic is super powerful. We can just access the microkernel directly by going into slash DOS. That starts up the microkernel directly. And we have a help command here that can show us what's possible with this. As I said, this is pretty limited. It's a very early stage of this system. There's not a lot you can do, but this is only the microkernel. Super basic is a lot more powerful than this. But we can do things like read files and write files and do hexadecimal dumps of files, remove files and rename files, things like that, which is pretty handy to have. Just wanted to quickly show you this. We can execute files that are in different memory locations than your usual basic files, which is also pretty handy because uh, most more sophisticated stuff is assembler binary files, which we have to sideload on this via the debug port, actually. I'm not going to go into that in this video because that is a bit more complex, unfortunately, but it is easy enough so that I'm pretty sure I can figure that out. And there are some super beautiful software titles that are in development for this system already. If you want to check some of that out, I recommend following the Discord channel for Phoenix Retro Systems. There are quite a few developers uh, on the issue and making games and demos and all kinds of stuff that I'm going to show you next time we revisit this system. I also really wanted to show you the FNX 1591 in action, but unfortunately, as it turns out, this ships without a kernel ROM. So we have to flash a kernel ROM onto this, which also is a bit of a process that I'm going to show you in another video. But it is pretty easy. There's a flashing software available that you just download. You install some drivers for the USB controller that's in the system and also in the Phoenix itself. And then you can communicate with that simple to use software and load kernel ROMs in the different kernel banks that we have on here. And then you can select the kernel with the dip switches here. And as I mentioned, this should also work with Commodore machines because it is allegedly fully compatible with the 1581. So that's going to be super interesting to check out. In this stage, I can't really do anything with this. The uh, power LED comes on and the activity LED comes on, but nothing else happens. So we are going to have to flash the firmware on this in the next video. And I'm also going to show you some more software for this in the next video when I have that figured out. There are some simple sound commands actually implemented in the basic to try the sound capabilities of this. I'm just doing a zap here, just a zap command. We also have shoot. I think we also have explode. Yeah, <laughs> that's just a bit of a demo here. Zap again. So you can use these. Of course, this has the ability to display 64 sprites at once and it also has smooth scrolling. The basic comes with an inline assembler. So just like BBC basic, you can just put 
assembler code in a basic program and execute that so you have the easier to access basic language and have the power of assembler which of course in this case is 65c02 assembler and i have to say this already looks pretty stylish i like the rainbow colored logo and uh, i also like the whole design and the feel of the system the keyboard feels super nice it is a very nice to type on keyboard, obviously, because these are modern key switches. And I also like the fact that this just, you can just program away in basic, right off the bat. So my usual little demo program. And you can see that this system works pretty fast with the 65 CO2 processor, which is running at a vastly higher clock speeds than the old 6502 processes were able to run at. So this is pretty nice and I'm looking forward to tinker more with this. Super happy with it so far. It looks beautiful, works beautifully. As I said, this system is in its very early stages. I think it was just released half a year ago and there was not much publicity going on. There are a couple of YouTube channels that made videos about this and I'm going to link some of that in the video description in case you are interested and as I said I'm going to do at least one more video about this thing as soon as I have figured more stuff out and uh, show you some more sophisticated demos and things like that. The basic already feels pretty cozy to me uh, because I like programming a basic, actually the only programming language I know my way around halfway. The capabilities of this sound wise, graphics wise, uh, we are only scratching the surface here obviously because uh, this can do so much more, especially if you program it in assembler or in C. There is a whole development IDE for this available which looks pretty cool and it should be easy to work with for the programmer type of people, which I am definitely not. And in case you already want to buy one of these, the website, the shop on the website is open. You can see how much this costs. It's not cheap, but uh, naturally this isn't a large production run product. So uh, it is very low volume. It is all hobbyist made. Uh, the manufacturing involves a 3D printed resin printed case as we've seen. So that's all pretty expensive to make. It costs I think $595 at the current point. Stephanie told me that she extended the order period to mid-July so you can easily get one. They are made to order so uh, it's going to take a bit before you actually get the device but I think it's worth it maybe. If you are into tinkering with a new retro system, uh, you can download an emulator for the Phoenix Junior, which basically has the same features as this, to program on and check out the system's capabilities without actually owning one. You can run that on your modern computer. It is quite nice to have this in this uh, little form factor, which just takes one back to the days the glorious days of uh, computers. And I'm super happy in general that there are so many new systems that are inspired by the good old 80s and 90s retro computers these days. So if you're an enthusiast like me, you are probably going to enjoy it. And if you have a bit of money to spare, I can recommend getting one of these, I guess. It is a beautifully designed system and we're going to take more in-depth looks at this soon. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks again Stephanie for sending me this review unit. Very much appreciated. And thanks everybody else involved in the project for making it happen in the first place. Pretty happy that there are so many new retro systems around these days as I mentioned probably a million times now. Special thanks go out to everybody who supports me on Patreon or on the channel memberships page on YouTube or on Ko-fi or via single donations on PayPal or elsewhere. The links to that are in the video description. And obviously donations are highly appreciated because this channel wouldn't exist without your support. Thanks for watching. I'm Jan Beta. See you next time. Bye.